this lecture is on sociological institution of government and a lot of the material comes from Richard Schaefer's textbook sociology matters So what we'll cover within this lecture is what is power, what are the three basic sources of power within the government or political system, what is authority, what are Weber's three ideal types of authority, what type of government do we have in the United States, and what is Mill's model of the U.S. power structure. And I'll also introduce a couple of other models of the U.S. power structure um, or of power structure in general and a criticism of the power structures. So politics, as Harold Laswell defined it in 1936, is who gets what, when, and how. And as sociologists, what we are concerned with is social interactions among individuals and groups and that impact on the larger political and economic order. Now, according to Weber, power is the ability of an individual or group to achieve their own goal or aims when others are trying to prevent them from realizing them. So, uh, it is the ability to exercise one's will over others. In other words, whoever controls the behavior of others is exercising power. And the power relations can be large, as in organizations, it can be small, as in small groups, or it can be in dyads or triads. So, um, you know, this is a, a very basic concept of how Weber conceptualized power, and he did this in the 1900s, uh, in 1922. And basically, Weber uh, focused primarily on the nation-state and, and how the nation-state held a sphere of influence. Now, now we are looking at a, a trend toward globalization and a differing uh, power structure. Um, so it's not just a national uh, power structure. Now we're looking at global um, countries and multinational corporations who are um, fighting to control access to resources. If we think about resources such as oil or um, natural gas or water or or even uh, resources such as human capital and also to control and manage the distribution of capital. One of the reasons why I added what is power in a couple of quotes that are um, pretty famous. Epitasyu uh, says, the measure of a man is what he does with power. And this is also kind of goes along with um, what we say about uh, power uh, from a structural standpoint, particularly within a political sphere, um, as, uh, you know, what what a man does it, it, with power uh, measures him uh, as a uh, either a compassionate individual or a dictator or uh, whatever the the term is that we're currently using within within the power um, definitions. And then probably the most famous uh, one is Lord Acton, who said, "Power tends to corrupt." Absolute power corrupts absolutely. And you'll hear this a lot, uh, both of these quotations a lot, uh, when discussing power, particularly within the United States, um, from a political standpoint.
So Weber uh, identified power as either being authoritative or coercive. And authoritative power, the way that Weber sees it, is exercising power, which is seen as legitimate. So legitimacy being that you've either been assigned uh, this power role, uh, you've been elected into this power role, um, but w basically what we're saying is we um, have consented to you having this position. And, and it also indicates that um, legitimate power is effective because those of us who are subject to the power do so with consent. So we've either elected you into this position, um, we have given you the title and the power position, or uh, but we are consenting to the power structure. However, um, a, 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 a oppositional of that is coercion which is where uh, someone has power through force. So you've either uh, stolen an election, uh, we don't consider you having legitimate power, um, you forced this, um, and you're forcing uh, someone to do something against their wishes. So I look at this from a very basic standpoint of power with consent, um, or power without consent. And and this this is Weber's classification of authority. We'll we'll get more into authority in a few minutes. Now, there are three basic sources of power in a political system and and uh, we'll go over these three in the next few slides. But the first one is force. Um, the next is influence, and the last is authority, and we'll probably focus more on authority than force or influence. So when we talk about force as a source of power, um, this is the actual coercion or threatened use of coercion in order to impose one's will on others. So when a government or a, a leader imprisons or executes political dissidents, um, they're using force. And so if you look at uh, how political dissidents have been treated, uh, across the world, whether it's been uh, Angela Davis, whether it's been Nelson Mandela, whether it's been uh, Gramsci or Trotsky, um, some of the the political dissidents have been uh, imprisoned. Um, then there there are also uh, political dissidents who have been executed. Um, now. You know, this this is, uh, we want to sometimes believe that this is, in fact, uh, not occurring within the United States. However, um, in the case of, of Angela Davis, um, we can uh, see how, how that is, has really gone through, as also uh, in political dissidents from the 60s. Um, who were still imprisoned, uh, members of the Black Panther movement, who were still in prison. Um, and so we do see that that this is a, a big part of force, um, even bringing in military, and we'll talk about that at a later time. Now, in 21st century, one of the, the things as far as force, um, you know, we have a lot of, of rights within our country as far as freedom of speech. Um, however, uh, we also have to look at how there is um, the use of the Internet. Now, we're, we are seeing uh, nations um, really clamp down on the internet and the media um, that opposes the central government 
or uh, freedom of expression, uh, arguing for human rights, um, or even espousing minority or religious views, um, that these are being censored. To the point now um, where our current leader um, is, is really attacking the media and journalists on a daily basis. And so while we have seen this in other countries, um, you know, we are starting to see this in in even uh, democracies. Now, one of the things that, that you know, I, I want you to look at on this, this page basically is this is, um, this is just as much uh, censorship um, of online access and content as if we, uh, as, a, as a nation, censored a newspaper by walking into the Washington Post and uh, informing them that they are now closed or uh, arresting a journalist as dissidents. Um, so you can see uh, that there are a list of online censorship ranked by country. Uh, we can also talk about what, what has been blocked in, in various countries and uh, then, you know, the, the rights of the uh, citizenry to, for, uh, especially within the United States, um, to use our free speech um, and use our rights to criticize the government or to talk about human rights or to espouse our minority or religious um, views. And another source of power is influence. And, and this is actually using, um, it's an exercise of power through a process of persuasion. So it might be that we, we have an uh, op-ed, an opinion, uh, editorial essay. Um, now, another thing that we might look at is that this is a process of persuasion and one of the one of the biggest pieces of persuasion is speech so if we are looking at um famous speeches famous persuasive speeches um how people can uh, change uh the uh political uh under uh, the underlying political beliefs within a country, we can also look at our persuasive speeches. So when we have uh, the speech of uh, John F. Kennedy uh, talking about uh, ask not what uh, your country is, has you know done for you, ask what you have done for your country. When we talk about Barack Obama and his persuasive speech of, we don't ask you to believe in our ability to bring change, uh, we ask you to believe in yours. Um, Ronald Reagan infamously stood before, uh, stood in front of a wall, um, and asked Mr. Gorbachev to tear down the wall. Um, and for those of you who um, have read uh, Martin Luther King's "I Have a Dream" speech, this also these are these are persuasive speeches that actually changed some of the courses of history. And so this is influence. These are influential people uh, who uh, persuaded us from a political standpoint simply by the words and the, the power uh, that they spoke from. Now, let's come back to um, authority as a source of power. And re remember, um, now we're talking about authority uh, refers to power that has been institutionalized and is recognized by the people over whom it is exercised. So um, this is also, uh, we talked about uh, legitimate power, but one of the things we want to look at is authoritative power isn't coercive. And remember, Weber talked about authoritative power, but it does manifest it, itself in three forms. So you have charismatic authority, traditional authority, and rational legal authority. And we're going to cover those three and not necessarily in that order. 
So first, let's go over uh, traditional authority. And so traditional authority is authoritative power, which comes from a custom by passing power down on a hereditary basis. Um, and this this type of power requires reinforcement of of tradition and traditional uh, authority to remain stable. So whether it's the Queen of England, whether it's King Tut, it it we're looking at um, it is in custom. It's not in competence. It's not in in personal characteristics. Um, it may or may not be in written law. Um, the ruler may be loved, hated. They may be competent. Um, but in terms of legitimacy, uh, none of that matters. Um, and, and people accept this authority because, first, this is how things have always been done. And so we're looking at this from a traditional standpoint. Tradition dictates who is the leader. So the, the second is uh, charismatic authority, and charismatic authority is power based on charisma. Um, it's, it's the person's personal qualities. Now, um, charisma and charismatic authority, the charismatic authority is we uh, make legitimate the power by um, emotional appeals or their exceptional uh, personal uh, appeals to us um, as individuals, groups, or a nation. And uh, charisma uh, allows a person to lead or to inspire us without relying on tradition. And so the charismatic authority really comes more from the belief of our followers, of the followers of the charismatic person, than from the qualities of the leaders. So as long as the per as as we as people, as we as society perceive a leader to have qualities that set them apart from us or ordinary citizens, then that leader's authority remains secure and oftentimes unquestioned. Um, so here is one thing that, you know, we, we definitely know, um, is that charismatic leaders, um, can, can be, uh, divisive. They can be detrimental. They can be evil. Um, but that has absolutely nothing to do with it. It is the, the charisma of the person that we are believing in the person. We have a close association with one person. And so, you know, this could range from from anywhere such as uh, Cesar Chavez to uh, Nelson Mandela, again, Martin Luther King, again, Gandhi, um, uh, Che Guevara, um, Malcolm X, uh, you know, Malcolm X being a very charismatic um, leader, a very charismatic speaker, um, and so his authority as a religious leader um, within the nation of Islam uh, really uh, brought more people in, uh, and he really emphasized the the other leader uh, who. Uh, was Elijah Muhammad. So if we are are, are looking at um, leaders who are charismatic, who are bringing people in, as as we look at these people, we think, wow, what great uh, individuals all of these these men, and, and I'm saying that because there are so uh, much more men from a traditional um, patriarchal standpoint. But, you know, we also have to include people like Hitler, uh, who was a very charismatic leader, uh, very charismatic speaker, a very persuasive speaker, um, and and yet did great harm uh, to to his country and did great harm to uh, the world. And and I included Jim Jones um, because Jim Jones, while a religious cult figure. Um, really preached a message of 
uh, unity, um, his his followers followed him to their death. And so this really uh, shows that you can have charismatic authority uh, and it can be very unstable. Uh, it can be very detrimental because of your close association uh, to that individual. Um, one of the things that I also would like to say uh, within this is sometimes we as sociologists uh, study, you know, and we, we're always concerned about how how do people uh, exercise their their uh, vote uh, as well. We work with, uh, you know, sociologists have been doing this long before political scientists. And one of the things that we want to look at, why do people vote against even their own best or self-interest? And a, a lot of it has to do with the development of charismatic authority. And, and particularly, um, the, I think we're going to see this m- more and more and more. And, and so as Carl Couch uh, in 96 really pointed out that, that the electronic media, so our social media, um, our, our 24-hour news cycle has, has really helped to develop charismatic authority uh, within people. Um, and, you know, this can be great, as in how we got uh, Barack Obama as a president for eight years. Uh, it could be detrimental uh, as to someone who is a celebrity um, who uh, touts uh, not vaccinating your children. Uh, that could also be very detrimental. Um, and and so, you know, we we look at this from how has media develop charismatic leaders. Um, how has media uh, brought this in? I would even say someone even like Oprah, uh, that the the television and uh, news media has has really exploded Oprah's appeal. She's a very charismatic speaker. Uh, she's an extremely charismatic leader, so much so that people have encouraged her to run for political office. Um, so, you know, the, this is something that we'll really start looking at uh, within sociology um, now and later is how within the 21st century is the media and social media particularly um, facilitated development of charismatic authority. The next is uh, rational legal authority, and rational legal authority, the, the authority is in the office, so it doesn't, it's not specific to the person. Um, it is, um, you know, we're making this legitimate by procedures, by rules, by institutions, and rational legal authority is relatively stable. So uh, when we look at um, the President of the United States, this is rational legal authority, a member of the Supreme Court, uh, regardless of their personality um, uh, and regardless of their competence and authority, um, this is not, uh, it's not reliant within the persona, it is reliant within the office. And, and also even as a police chief, Um, You know, this is within the office, not the individual. Um, This is relatively stable. Um, This also, the the rational legal authority is not thought to be endowed with divine inspiration, as in societies with, say, uh, more traditional forms of authority, uh, such as uh, hereditary uh, advancement or uh, kings or queens who may be heads of, of churches as well as heads of state. This is actually just a, a authority within the office, not the person. So when we are looking at the United States, partic- particularly, uh, we're, we're viewing who rules, who rules in the U.S. So who really holds power? Is it really we the people? Do we really run the country through our elected officials? Or is it uh, manipulated that a small elite 
behind the scenes controls our governments and our economic systems. Um, so, you know, within the United States, you know, it, this is very, very difficult to uh, determine a location of centralized power um, in a society as complex as the U.S. because we have um, states, we have territories, we have um, a lot of different interests, uh, competing interests. And, you know, I, I think that Voltaire uh, really nails this as as a way to learn who rules over you, just find out who you are not allowed to criticize. Um, and and so who can you not criticize? Who can you not uh, complain about? So within power elite models, there are several different power elite models, and we'll we'll go over those. But Marx actually had a power elite model, and and he argued that 19th century representative democracy was basically a sham. Um, he said uh, that those who had economic power, those who the you know in his worms the bourgeoisie, uh, those people who own the factories uh, and control the national resources. These are the people who hold the power. So um, on the next slide, I've actually constructed, I hope, a model that will show you how Marx believed um, society was ruled. So uh, I'm calling it, this is Marx's elitist model. And one of the things, if you, if you look at this, so at the bottom you see us, the people, um, and and we are uh, our representative government. Uh, we vote. Um, we cast a ballot, and our government officials are elected. Now we vote uh, our uh, our own way of thinking aligned with whichever government official we are voting for. So we're hoping that these guys are representing us. And what Marx is saying is that the government officials and the military leaders, so you see that over on the right side, are actually not representing us as the masses of the people, but they're representing the capitalist class. And that the government officials and the military leaders are servants of the capitalist class and that they follow the interest um, of the capitalist class. And so what, what we can look at, how we can look at this from a United States perspective, is that government officials make laws. Um, and and we can also look at how are government officials funded to run for office. Well, the capitalist class donates money. Now we as as um, the masses may also donate money. Um, but you know, as we saw within the whole um, ability of of uh, the political action committees, um, you know, we may contribute five or ten dollars. We may contribute a hundred dollars. Maybe even if we're really bold, we'll step out and contribute three to five hundred dollars. Okay, but the capitalist class is is contributing hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars. And so the capitalist class is putting all this money into the election, and they're saying, here is what we want. And so the capitalist class is telling the government officials, here's what we want. The people that have more airtime, that have more money, that can get out and travel more, are usually the people who get elected, which is why we're seeing a lot of uh, interesting, uh, particularly in, in this recent election in uh, 2018, where we're seeing some some unknowns. This this is where the masses are are really speaking uh, loudly. Um, but the government officials come in and and they are in charge of making laws and rules. And so, who are they going to make the rules for? Um, well, Marx says that the uh, the um, government officials. Um, are servants of the capitalist class. And so whatever the capitalist class says, here's what we want. Uh, the government officials make laws and then say, okay, see, now here is what you wanted. Um, 
and also that the capitalist class influences the military leaders saying, hey, uh, here is what we want as well. Um, and the government officials are talking to the military and saying, oh, here is what they want. Here is what the capitalist class wants. Now, let me say that then the government officials are in charge of giving the money to the military leaders. So within the government budget. And that this, again, is what you know Marx is discussing, is that um, all of these key decisions made by politicians reflect the interest of the dominant bourgeoisie. And so all of this is happening as to uh, what the capitalist uh, class wants. And, and so this is, uh, Marx believed, that society is ruled by a small group of individuals who share a common set of political and economic interests. The capitalist class, the bourgeoisie. And when we're talking about the bourgeoisie, um, let's also say that, you know, this, this is a very, uh, as you'll see in some other models, there's some fluidity that runs between the capitalist class, military leaders, and government officials. Um, and you'll, you'll see this within um, another uh, power uh, elite model or, or two. Okay, so C. Wright Mills uh, took Marx's model and went a little bit further with it. And so he actually, he wrote a book called The Power Elite in uh, 1956. And um, his definition of the power elite is, by the power elite, we refer to those political, economic, and military circles, which as an intricate set of overlapping cliques, share decisions having at least national consequences. Insofar as national events are decided, the power elite are those who decide them. And so M Mills is saying this is a, a small group of military, industrial, and government leaders who control the fate of the United States. And power is in the hands of the few inside and outside the government called the power elite. All right, so now we're at Mill's power elite model. So you can see, again, very similar to what was structured within Marx's elite model. Um, you have the masses of people. They're unorganized. They're exploited. They're mostly uninterested. And one other, I want to focus on this mostly uninterested. Now, um, you know, uninterested being that there are many, many, many people who are eligible to vote who do not vote. And so uh, they may choose not to vote. They may not know who to vote for. They may uh, use this uh, concept of, well, my vote doesn't count anyway. They're just going to steal it. But, but these are people who are uninterested in politics. They're uninterested in power. Um, they're, they're also just trying to scrape by. They're just trying to get through the day. Um, and I think that this is very important for us to understand that that is a large number of people. Um, now, uh, if, if we look at the middle level, um, this is, uh, the, the legislative, um, branch of government. So you've got Congress. You have um, leaders of special interest groups. Um, you have, uh, you know, these these group. This is the group that uh, Marx uh, talked about from the the concept of they are the people who do the bidding of the capitalist. Uh, class now the 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 very top the very top the top leaders this is the corporate political and military and this is so we're looking at corporate rich individuals leaders of the executive branch of government and heads of the military now Mills actually calls the heads of the military warlords 
So th- this is very fascinating. And and um, then what he says is that the middle group, this group in yellow, the middle level, um, follows the wishes of the uh, the very tip top of the pyramid. Um, and at the bottom are, are just us. Now, this is very, very similar to the work of Marx. Um, the, the difference is that Mills believe that the, um, the bourgeoisie, the economically powerful, the very top, uh, coordinated their maneuvers with the military and the power establishment to serve their common interest. Yet, um, Mills argued that the corporate rich were perhaps the most powerful element of the power elite. And so, um, the bottom, the power last, uh, power masses at the bottom, uh, bring to mind Marx's portrait of the oppressed workers of the world who have, um, quote, nothing to lose but their chains. Now, um, one element within Mill's thesis is that the power elite operates as a self-conscious cohesive unit. Um, now, so they all want the same things. And, and Mills is, is considering that, you know, this is not a conspiracy. This is not necessarily a diabolical or it's ruthless, but because the elite has similar types of people who interact with one another regularly. They have the same political and economic interest that um, this is why they they have a community of interest and sentiment among a small number of influential people. So it's a very small number. And estimates globally, the global small number um, is estimated to be around 6,000 people. Now, you know, when we look at this from, uh, you know, I, I want to say um, we look at the G7, we look at the G20, um, these are global leaders, um, and, and you know, we, we want to look at the uh, International Money Fund, we want to look at the IMF, uh, we might want to look at the UN, um, all of these different power structures, you know, when, when you start looking at business leaders, you'll see Yale, Harvard, um, Oxford. You'll see some of the leading universities within the global uh, world uh, showing up. And these, these are the people who, who socialize together. Their children marry each other. Um, you know, they, they go to the same clubs. They attend the same schools. They're members of the same organization. Um, you know, we can actually break this down even not just from a global perspective, but you know, you could look at it from a, a small, uh, group, even within a, a town, uh, of, who went to what school, who holds the power, um, whose family had money. So a lot of these different, um, this power structure, you know, we can see that the interest of the top, uh, not even one percenters, uh, we might even say the point one percenters, um, the inter- their interest um, is, is, is the same. It's consolidation of power, but it, it's community of interest, and this is what they're all interested in. We're not saying Mills is not talking about a conspiracy, and, and I think that this is is really uh, important that Mills does not consider this a, a, a conspiracy. Now, one thing that um, Mills did not do, he he really um, failed to substantiate the relationship, the inner relationship among the power members of the power elite. Um, and so also uh, he he failed to clarify when the elite opposes protest and when it tolerates them. Uh, so, you know, if we're looking at it from a, a, you know, I can come back and talk about Kent State um, in Ohio, uh, protest from the Vietnam War, you know, whose economic interests were um, were within the Vietnam War, and who did not have economic interests. So, uh, did they uh, want to shut down the protest, or did they um, 
decide to allow the protests. Well, um, if you go back and you read the historical constructs uh, of what was going on during that time frame, uh, it was upsetting to the status quo, it was upsetting to the top leaders, it was upsetting from a, a corporate, political, and military perspective, and so they wanted it shut down. And this is why the National Guard was also brought in at, at Kent State. So, Mills had the power elite model, and, and you know, uh, he was not even looking from a global standpoint. I think this is, some, this is relatively new. This, there, is, there is a whole um, idea of the um, global power elite. So, who are the, this is the super class. These are the people who are the top uh, 0.1%. And these are business, political, former military leaders who exercise influence across national borders. So it's not just influence within the United States, but it's influence across the globe. Um, and, and so I've put, um, eight people up, um, on the screen. And so you'll see, you know, first Rupert Murdoch, who is originally from Australia, who owns Fox News. Okay. So now you've got, um, got him. Uh, you have, uh, Sir Bob Geldorf, uh, and, and Geldorf is, um, one of the, he's been uh, knighted, uh, he's Irish, uh, he did uh, the We Are the World, he's a very huge philanthropist. Um, now, Oli Deripaska is a, is a Russian businessman, and so you're going to hear, um, if you are listening to any of the the um, Russia investigation out of the Mueller reports, um, you're going to hear Oli Deripaska's name a lot come up. Now, Rex Tillerson was actually uh, within the role of uh, Secretary of State recently, but he is a former Exxon uh, mobile CEO, and so, you know, he has a lot of influence across uh, the the U.S. and the globe. And, you know, then we're, we're looking at the bottom. These are all probably people that you recognize, so we're, we're looking at the Pope, uh, Oprah, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and Bill Gates. Now, you know, this, because we're, we're just as sociologists really, um, starting to look at, uh, the global power elite, um, you know, there's some disagreement on how do we, how do we do this? So, do the members of the global power elite have as much consensus as the member of Mills power elite? Or can the global power elite, um, include diversity so can it can it include a great diversity of power um, from uh, kind of like the good bad and the ugly all right so now we get to a uh, Domhoff uh, model and and so uh, sociologist G William Domhoff has um, Agreed with Mills that there is a powerful elite who runs the United States, and and his he actually says that um, this is still largely white, still largely male, and upper class. And though, uh, so you see, you see the social upper class, and you you see, and I, I want to I want you to focus on the overlap that he has. Uh, where he is circled in black, uh, the power elite. And you see how this comes out of CEOs, boards of directors, boards of trustees. Um, this comes from social upper class. It comes from, um, from two coalitions. And, and it, and it's not just, um, the corporate community. These are leaders of organizations also uh, within policy planning networks. So you might look at the Chamber of Commerce. You might look at labor unions. Um, and, and it also might mean that the, the people in both groups are still members of, if you see the overlap, the members of the social upper class. And there are a presence of a small number of men, minority men, and women um, in in key positions and and meals uh, these this group was um, excluded completely from meals um, but although it is still uh, very much under representation of of uh, based on gender and minority status so 
while the three groups in the power elite model overlap, they do not necessarily agree on specific policies. So you have these two coalitions. And so you have a corporate conservative coalition who plays a large role in, in each of the political parties, the, each of the two major political parties, and generate support for political particular political candidates. But you also have a liberal labor coalition um, that is based in unions, local environmental organizations, minority groups, liberal churches, um, academia, the university, and an arts community. So, you know, we might talk about Hollywood or or um, or or that particular group. However, um, Dom Haas model is actually um, really shows, in my opinion, more of the the fact that the power elite uh, overlaps these communities. This is the this is the movement in and out of the um, power elite uh, from different groups. So now the pluralist pluralist model really talks about how, particularly within the United States, power is more widely shared than the elite models. So, so you see, um, you know, we might talk about this, um, and I, I like Elizabeth Warren's uh, concept of the tippy top uh, being in charge. But the what the pluralist model um, says that there are many competing groups within the community who have access to government officials. So there really is no single group that's dominant. And so let's look at the model. So you have the triangle. Um, which is house it, which is our political system. So the triangle represents our political system. The um, the uh, circle represents society. Now, if you look at the very bottom again, similar to what we see from the masses, the the masses within Marx and Mills uh, models, um, and within Dumhoff uh, Dumhoff's model, uh, one of the things uh, that we see these are these are individuals without influence. Um, because they're not in groups, they haven't aligned themselves with a the group. Um, they they are are not located within a group. Um, so uh, you know this whole model is based on okay now as as individuals um, we form into groups. You know and and what are our groups? So as silly as this sounds, um, you know this might be the um, we want uh, chocolate brownies every Friday group, and the we don't want chocolate brownies every Friday group. Um, so that's two competing groups, right? It's two competing interest groups. So if, you know, if you are with the uh, we want chocolate uh, brownies every Friday group, um, you may be in one group, and your opposition is the we don't want chocolate brownies every Friday group. And so you're petitioning to have chocolate brownies on Friday, and the other group is petitioning to not have chocolate brownies on Friday with their their uh, reasoning. Now, uh, that sounds very silly, but, you know, the, you can actually use that in the concept of um how people consider abortion. Uh, you might consider it from a pro-life, pro-choice perspective. And and so these are groups that we form within society. And so these groups play a significant role in decision, decision ma- making. Um, and so um, what Dahl found out is that there are a lot of uh, the the number of people involved in any decision is small. The community power is um is across different groups it's um there there are uh the fact that very few political actors exercise decision making power on all issues well here's the decision makers the groups in competition with one another for power so let's say that we have um uh two we find two other groups uh, to bring into our chocolate brownie on every uh, every Friday group, and the anti-chocolate brownie group uh, doesn't find anyone else. So how you know we're in competition? So maybe those three groups 
uh, are now aligned together. And it looks like more people than are for the, uh, their pro-chocolate brownie. Uh, and and there's uh, one group, one small group still out there who's anti-chocolate brownie. And so this kind of shows you how, uh, you know, an, a group might be, uh, you know, really good at doing one thing as well because they're extremely focused on one issue. That's all they're focused on, the pro-chocolate brownie or anti-chocolate brownie. And that's their only issue. They They really don't care about anything else. And so their influence, they come uh, to the decision makers and they say, hey, listen, here's our here's our idea. Um, you know, we're pro chocolate brownie and the other group that comes in is smaller and they say, well, we're anti chocolate brownie. So, you know, who who is going to hold more persuasion? Um, and now that, you know, the pluralist model also has its own uh, issues. And and so uh one of the things that that uh, people argue, sociologists have argued, is that Dahl and other pluralists did not show how elites prominent in local decision making belong to a larger national ruling class. That, you know, um, it, it fails to address the power of elites to keep certain matters that threaten their dominance entirely out of the realm of government debate. And, you know, that we're starting to see people speak out on this. And, and um, but, but these are, some, this is one of the criticisms of Dahl's pluralist model. One of the main uh, crit- critiques of Dahl's theory is uh, Diana, Diane uh, Penderhues. And she's a professor of political science and Africana studies at the University of Notre Dame. Well, she wrote uh, Race and Ethnicity in Chicago Politics, and she actually re-examined pluralist theory. Um, And she criticizes the pluralist model for failing to account for the exclusion of African Americans from the political um, process. And she says that, um, you know, within Chicago politics, the residential and occupational segregation of blacks and their long political disenfranchisement actually violates the logic of pluralism, um, which would would say that a substantial minority should always have been influential in the community decision making. And we can apply this critique to many cities across the United States where there are other large racial and ethnic minorities such as Asian Americans, uh, Puerto Ricans, and Mexican Americans who, who are uh, relatively powerless within the political process. And so so what Penderhues talks about is how um, Dahl's theory fails to take into account that even when, and this is uh, prior to Black Lives Matter, even when uh, minority groups get together, uh, that they still are politically disenfranchised. When in fact, they should not be disenfranchised uh, via pluralism, uh, they should have a greater voice. So it's a very good critique, very interesting critique, and it's all based on Chicago politics. Uh, we see the same thing within Detroit. We can see the same thing within uh, New Orleans. Uh, we can see the same thing within Houston and some of the other larger, and even Atlanta. Uh, we can see some of the some of the um, aspects within Atlanta, although although that may may be shifting. So, you know, as we're we're wrapping this section of, of government up, um, you know, what about the United States? And so, you know, th- this is where uh, how does how does Marx's model, Mills, um, uh, and uh, Dolls, uh, and uh, you know, h- how do these models fit uh, within the United States? Well, you know, we're learning. Uh, that, you know, as I said earlier, uh, communication technologies like the Internet um, are are really playing a huge part within our political process. Um, but a, a common point of the elite and the pluralist models is that um, power is unequally distributed. 
power is unequally distributed. And as, as Schaefer uh, says, all citizens may be equal in theory, but those who are high in the nation's power structure are more equal uh, and borrowing more equal from uh, Animal Farm, from uh, Georgia Orwell's Animal Farm. If you have not read that book, I suggest that you do. Um, and it, it doesn't matter, you know, th these are power struggles. Um, no matter what model we as sociologists use, it has a great deal to do with the distribution of our economic resources. And so uh, next we'll cover the economy and we'll talk about the, the theory and practicality of uh, the economic theory.